My name is Amelia, and I'm in fifth grade. The next speaker is Jimmy Song, and he will be talking about Bitcoin's anti-fragility. Yeah. yeah. All right. How's everyone doing? All right. You need your afternoon coffee a little bit? I don't know. That, that chicken tikka masala like, made me personally a little bit tired, uh, you know, just having to deal with all that. Oh, okay. Wow. I didn't even click. Okay. Anyway, uh, my, the title of my talk is Bitcoin's Anti-Fragility. Um, and I know the program is missing the apostrophe, so you might have been a little bit confused. Um, Bitcoin's Anti-Fragility. I'm going to talk about something that I think we all realize, but, you know, like, we're at a loss as to why that is. All right, so um, you guys are very familiar with this chart. How many of you own Bitcoin? How many of you almost threw up because things went up and down too much? It's definitely me. All right, so a lot of different things happen with Bitcoin, right? Like, there's, there's a lot of different uh, events that happen. And intuitively, we sort of know that it's anti-fragile. Who believes that Bitcoin is anti-fragile? All right, maybe, well, not that many of you. All right, so I, I, I will attempt to prove that to you. All right. So let's take a look at this chart. Um, 2013, who remembers what happened in 2013? Okay, what happened around July or August of 2013? Anyone know? Silk Road. Silk, ha Silk Road happened in 2013. A lot of people thought that that would cause the price of Bitcoin to drop precipitously and that that would be the end of Bitcoin. Instead, it went on a bear run. I mean, a bull run like never before, all the way up to over 1,000, a level not seen again for another three years. Um, that was 2013. More recently, um, you know, this, it's kind of crazy to think that this, this part is like the last year, right? But uh, what happened around uh, August? What happened around August of this year? No. Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash happened right before, right, right around here, right? Like there, there, was, there was a lot of fear right around, right before Bitcoin Cash, there's gonna be a hard fork, What's going to happen? Will the network be able to handle it? It was right around $2,700. And after that, Bitcoin Cash happened, and it, it's gone on a bull run like never before. These are disordering events, chaotic events, events that cause uh, you know, your stomach to churn a little bit because of all the uncertainty. And you would expect in a normal situation for the price of Bitcoin to go down. What we've seen, however, is that the price of Bitcoin goes up, right? Bitcoin is anti-fragile. It gains from disorder. It gains from chaos. And the question really now at hand is, why is that happening? The question isn't of whether or not it is anti-fragile. The price clearly reflects that. Why is it happening? And that's, that's what I'm seeking to answer in this presentation. So let's talk first about technological anti-fragility. Okay, and by that I mean sort of uh, all the technical aspects of it. The other two I'm going to talk about are economic and social, which, which we'll get to. But let's talk first about the technological disorder that can happen. All right, so in any sort of technological thing, you have uh, protocol level attacks, right? Like these are, that's kind of a nice way of saying exploiting bugs of some, one kind or another. Um, then there are denial of service attacks of all kinds, right? Like uh, a lot of people can hit your website, a lot of people can overuse your stuff or, you know, render it unusable as a result of somebody hitting it in a very particular way. And finally, uh, there are, you know, alternative choices, right? There might be new things that come on the market, the technical disruption uh, that may cause your product to go down. And, uh, and the key is, in a free market, there are very few guarantees, right? Uh, especially of your technology. Uh, there, you know, the market does not owe you, uh, you know, some sort of uh, customer base or profits or anything like that. You have to continually innovate. And as a result, we have very few guarantees, right? Uh, and contrast that to sort of like government-sponsored, centrally controlled things. They try to make guarantees, right? And, and we'll talk about that in a sec. So, if you look at Bitcoin, there are a lot of technical gains that we gain uh, when, when these various events happen. For example, we had transaction malleability. 
Um, and that's led to protocol strengthening, right? Like there's all sorts of bits that make it impossible to malleate. Uh, especially with SegWit now, it is literally impossible to malleate a transaction because the witness transaction ID is constant. Uh, throughput TX spam. Uh, you know, there, there, was, there were rumors of t transaction spam happening on the network. Lots, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, load tests and things like that uh, given by various companies, spending a lot of money, frankly, on fees in order to spam the network. Um, and we, we came through that. And as a result, uh, you know, of experiencing these uh, attacks, we ended up with second layer solutions like Lightning Network, payment channels. Um, they're, they're more coming into prominence, and people are working on them now. And finally, alternatives, right? Hard forks. We had the Bitcoin Cash hard fork. And that's led to better software. That's led, led to better software because we ended up with SegWit on one branch and you know, uh, Big Blocks on the other. They both advanced. They innovated as a result. And as a result of having very few guarantees, it's made us a more prudent community. And if you contrast that to sort of a centrally controlled, uh, government-backed kind, of, uh, kind of system, uh, you know, what, what the government would have done is they would have just sort of like regulated this sort of behavior away. They would have said, okay, anyone malleating a transaction, you're going to jail or you'll be fine. Uh, anyone spamming, found spamming the network, we will, you know, uh, find you and get you off the network or something like that. And that's the wrong, my, my uh, contention here is that that's the wrong way to do it, right? Having the community be prudent is the right way to do it. And we'll talk about that uh, why in a bit. All right, so... Really, um, if you think about it, why did Google succeed where Yahoo did not? And the reason is because of developers. And Bitcoin has the best developers, and that's why it is worth the most. Why is that? Well, it's because the developers have to react to all these attacks. Right? Bitcoin is not just software. That's a common misperception. Bitcoin is a network. And a net, uh, not just a network, it's a network of developers, and not just core developers, but wallet developers, merchant developers, payment processor developers, all kinds of developers that fix the system whenever attacks are made. Okay? So they strengthen the system anytime there is a disordering event. So in that way, the big, uh, Bitcoin is very organic. And it's very anti-fragile as a result. It gains from disorder. There is literally new code made every time there is an attack on the network, whether it be transaction spam, transaction malleability, or anything else. And developers are the, uh, are, are the reason why we have technological anti-fragility. All right, let's take a look at economic anti-fragility. And here are some attacks that you can, or, or disorder or chaotic events that you might have as a result, uh, that you can classify sort of as economic. Um, there can be like collapse of large companies, right? It's happened in 2008, Bear Stearns, anybody, right? Um, government bans, right? This is, a, this is an obvious one. This is regulating away sort of uh, a utility of something. Uh, and of course, bubbles, right? Like the, the irrational exuberance or whatever, um, sort of the market getting ahead of the technology or the utility or whatever it is. Again. Very few guarantees. And governments that try to add guarantees to the system tend to fail miserably or make the problem much, much worse. All right, let's take a look at the economic gains. What, how did Bitcoin handle this stuff? Well, Mt. Gox was a huge company and they collapsed. But that was a good thing because the weak companies died, right? And the strong companies survived. And, that, uh, and, and Bitcoin has had many, many exchanges that, has, that have gone through this process of uh, you know, bankrupting themselves as a result of theft or poor security practices or whatever. Those companies deserve to die. Not, they are not too big to fail, right? That's in, in very much in contrast to what the government thinks. Uh, China, China's banned Bitcoin like 15 times. Um, and the thing is, people find ways around governments, right? Local Bitcoin's volume went, went straight up, so they're like, oh, let's ban local Bitcoins. What do you think people are gonna do? They're gonna go to dark markets or something, right? Like there's always a way, and uh, all you're doing with regulation most of the time is just adding a tax, okay? And that's the tax of, you know, the threat of uh, arrest or fines or whatever. And bubbles, there's been a lot of bubbles. I have been through so many bubbles that I am steeled against it, right? It, Bitcoin drops $500, that's nothing, 
That's nothing. It went that four, uh, <laughs> three, no, four years ago on my birthday, it dropped like 70%, right? This was uh, Mount, famous Mount Gox Day, April 10th, 2013. It went from $266 to $53, right? It dropped insane amounts of money. So when I look at a $500 drop now, who cares? And people acclimate to this uncertainty. It's so, it, it, like, there's this expectation that it should stay in this narrow band. And that's kind of a wrong expectation, to be honest with you. And getting used to that uncertainty steals us. And, it, and, and because there are a few guarantees, we have a much more temperate community, a much wiser community, a community that isn't just like, you know, going crazy at like a 5% drop. And really, if you think about it, and like the 2008 bubble and stuff, the holders are what give it that economic anti-fragility. Because they hold through all of that stuff. Because they believe in Bitcoin. They believe in Bitcoin. And, and many of you are in this room. So, you know, congrats to you. Because you are the, the people that add the economic anti-fragility to Bitcoin. All right, let's, the last one is social anti-fragility. Social anti-fragility. Let's take a look at some attacks that you can do. Okay, I call this a tulip attack for some obvious reasons, but you know, people calling uh, you know, a new technology and scaring people about new technology is not new at all, okay? Like starting with electricity, right? People were saying like, uh, you know, you could kill an elephant with electricity. You know, think about the microwave. People were saying, you know, you, uh, it takes out all nutritional value when you microwave something. You know, cell phones, they were saying, oh, you're going to get cancer because it's right near your brain and, you know, all this other stuff. FUD is just the normal part of new technology, honestly. And that, that's happening with Bitcoin right now. All right, governance and takeover attempts. This, this happens a lot, sort of like a soft takeover of different technologies. Or bring, and this happens a lot with so, sort of social movements. People will sort of like jump in front of a crowd and say that they represent it when they really don't. Um, and finally, like sort of alternatives, right? Um, they, those things happen all the time. Uh, alternative uh, social constructs happen all the time and they try to take away the majority. Uh, again, no guarantees. And if you think about Bitcoin, it's really a big social experiment because the only people that give it value are you guys, right? Are the people. If you don't give it value, nobody values it. And really, uh, a lot of these can be characterized this way, right? I just heard about Bitcoin, I'm here to fix it, okay? And this happens so often with venture capitalists or you know, new pro professors that just read about Bitcoin and figure out all the things that are wrong with it or something. Uh, or an altcoin that's saying, we're going to launch and we're going to be way better than Bitcoin because we know how to fix Bitcoin. Well, you know, Bitcoin's like the biggest cryptocurrency by far, and, uh, and it's over, you know, 50% of the Bitcoin dominance index or whatever. It, it, I think this has been kind of, uh, you know, debunked to death. Like, you're not going to come fix Bitcoin, okay? Like, no matter how much expertise you have. So let's, let's take a look at how Bitcoins handle it. All right, Professor Bitcoin, anyone remember Professor Bitcoin? He said that it would drop to a dollar by like the summer of 2017 or something like that. It obviously hasn't. Uh, Jamie Dimon more recently, he said that Bitcoin's a scam. Uh, and you know, as a result of all of these people continuously saying that Bitcoin is a scam, we've all as a community become much less affected by appeals to authority. And that's a great thing. Uh, Hong Kong agreement, this was sort of like an industry takeover or just sort of like an attempt to impose governance on the entire community without the, the con consensus of the entire community. And, you know, it was frankly a lot of large businesses that tried to do it. And we've proven that they can't control Bitcoin. And finally, all these other altcoins and stuff like that, um, frankly, a lot of Bitcoin used to be full of a lot of scammers. Um, they've left and gone to these other things. So in, in many ways, Bitcoin has become much stronger as a result of all these attacks. And really, having no guarantees, it makes for a much more meritocratic community, right? A meritocratic community. If you do good work, you can prove it, and you, you know, uh, you're a voice that makes sense and you know, is a part of the community, you're, you're going to have more of a voice. You're, you're going to have more influence. And that's the way it should be. 
And really, um, that's, that's what I want to point you to. Bitcoin is really not just software. It is not software. It is all of you guys. All, all of you who own Bitcoin, who transact with Bitcoin, it is you. It's not just software. It is developers. It is holders. It is the community that gives it this anti-fragility. And the community in particular, the social community, is what gives it the social anti-fragility. It's the social aspect that allows you to reject the Jamie Dimon very quickly. And you know, the latest altcoin that comes out or ICO comes out or whatever is saying we're better than Bitcoin. Well, no, I don't know about that, right? And having fewer guarantees is a really good thing. And I think this is the key to why everything works out and why Bitcoin is so anti-fragile. It's the lack of guarantees. When you have a government that's backing you and sort of, uh, you know, being the lender of last resort or whatever, sort of saving you from yourself, that doesn't make you stronger, right? That makes the system more fragile. And really, having fewer guarantees encourages individual virtue. It makes you more prudent, it makes you more temperate, it makes you reward merit rather than position. And that in the end, makes for a much stronger community. It makes for a much stronger Bitcoin, a much more anti-fragile Bitcoin. And that's why whenever all of these things come, whenever crises come in Bitcoin and we survive, it keeps going up. Thank you. So they don't, they don't leave. All right, so we, we have, uh, we have crypt crypto HD wallets that's going to do a giveaway right now. If you guys are in the hallway, you might want to come in to see if you got the raffle number. Actually, no, it's not given away right now. Oh, I just want to okay, announce right. the giveaway at the end of the conference so we keep everybody uh, sticking around. <laughs> By the end of the conference, we will be passing out Trezor, Ledger, Digital Bitbox, and Crypto HW wallet leather cases. So I want to give everybody an equal chance. Make sure you get your uh, badge out. And then on the back of the badge, there's a number. I will be announcing those numbers with my colleague here. We're going to be passing them out. So stick around. By the end of the conference, do not leave. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff.